Singapore, as you know, has a big problem with abandoned dogs. Yes. And right now there's about 7,600 dogs that Singapore has reported that have been turned over to Singapore because it's it's a little bit more difficult to own an, a dog here in Singapore. Yes. It just, it's a little bit more Even difficult. logistically, Log you have to live in a certain place to own the dog. Yes, it, it, there's, there's difficulties. Well, the book came about because my husband and I got a puppy and the breeder says, you have to. This the, yes. the puppy? There's, yes. There's the, the black puppy one. here. The black, oh, the black one. one. Okay. My Rudder Nohea, my beautiful new direction. <laughs> and the breeder says, you have to train this dog. And I said, I know how to train him. And she says, mm hmm. So we train every week, every Saturday from 9 to 11 a.m. Everybody meets, everybody trains. And we all did. Two full years, we trained our dog, our, the litter together, all yep. eight puppies. And we, tra we taught the dogs basic obedience, sit, stay down. We taught the dogs how to swim. Now they're water dogs, so it was pretty natural, but we spent six weeks trying to teach the dogs not to drown if they ever <laughs> fall into water. Then we did you know, the agility, the weave yep. pulls you see it on TV, the yep. jump, the run, the fetching, the fr I, two years worth of training for these dogs. So they're very well trained. Are the lessons here from two years training yes. your dog? <laughs> yes. And so what happened was I started to take the lessons that I was using with the dogs into the workplace and things were going really well. So I thought, I'm onto something here. And you notice when you got your dog, when the dog does something right, mm -hmm. so what's your dog's name? Chara. Chara. Charo? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chara with R, yeah, Chara. Charo, mm -hmm. okay. So you say, a girl or boy? Girl. Girl. So, girl. yes, a girl. <laughs> so when she does something right, you say, good girl, and yes. you give her a treat. Yes. And when she does something bad, you have to correct the behavior, but if you're mean about it, then she just learns to be mean. Well, she, so, then she wouldn't talk to me for three days. This right. Because she's a girl, clearly. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So if, she, if a dog or a puppy does something bad, you ignore the bad behavior, you turn your back on them, which is very bad. In doggy world, turning your back is being shunned. Yep. And they learn that that's not okay. But every time somebody does something right, or your dog does something right, and you go, here's a little treat, here's a coffee, here's $5, all of a here's sudden people book. go, hey, this is fantastic. <laughs> And in the workplace, we don't, we don't reward good behavior. Mm. What happens in the workplace is we get somebody who's fantastic and we take all the work and we give it to that person. And meanwhile, the person who's not so fantastic doesn't have to do the work. So you're punishing the person who's doing all the work and you're letting the other person not work. You're kind of rewarding them for bad behavior. And in the dog world, that's like when you call your dog, you go, cha -da -cha, and she comes to you and you just give her the hand or you walk away. And then she's discouraged. And then you do that over and over and I she would learns never not do to this come. to my of dog. Course, it's, horrible. It's, a, it's a horrible thing to think about with your puppy. But if you did that with your dog, she would be discouraged. But we do it with people all the time. We take people and we give them, they're our go-to people because we can always trust them. We can always trust them. So they get the bulk of the work and meanwhile, the, the bad dogs at work get rewarded, and that's crazy. So the whole point of this book is to try to work with people the way good dog owners work with their dogs. So I had one event where a guy said, if I treated my people the way I treated my dogs, I'd be in jail. <gasps> I said, where do you live? I'm gonna come rescue your dog. <laughs> a very bad human, bad human. And then it's consistency. So people say, well, I don't have time to train my dog. I say, you don't have time not to train your dog. And it takes five minutes a day, three minutes in the morning, two minutes at night. Mm -hmm. And you just, you grab some treats and you, you call the puppy over and you say, come here, baby girl. And you call her by her name and she comes and you go, good girl, come. And she goes, come, I got it. Mm -hmm. And then you hold up the treat around her nose and her nose goes up and her butt. Her, yes. uh, yeah, the Hawaiian word is okole, which oh. sounds so nice. I don't know what it is in Russian. Um, popka. Okay, see Let's that's say that. Russia has many names for that. Yes, you have to think, use the nice one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so which one is the <laughs> nicest one? Right. So I always use okole because it sounds nice. And okole. so then you, you raise the treat up and her nose goes up, which means her little okole goes down. And as soon as it hits the ground, you say, sit. So she realizes that's what she wants. And then she gets a treat. And then you say, you know, come. And she goes, oh, there's going to be a treat. Well, if we did that with people, if every time they did something right, we rewarded them, they'd do it a lot more often. And that's just not what happens. And it doesn't take much, it just takes consistency. Mm. And in the workplace, we also, we also are not consistent. So if we say, we want to start at 5 o'clock, but you always start at 5.30, people learn, you don't mean 5 o'clock, mm -hmm. you mean 5.30. 
And dogs know the same thing. So what kind of dog do you have? What, I mean, what kind of mix is she? It, she looks like a, a custom-made German Shepherd. Beautiful. So she's like a medium-sized Beautiful. German Shepherd. Right. So when you first get her, you want to, of course, give her lots of love and affection. Yep. And so let's say you let her up on the couch and you give her love and affection. And you do that for the first year or two because, you know, she's scared and she's had kind of a hard life. Mm -hmm. Well, now she's three years old, let's say, and now you say, oh, no, I don't want you on the couch. Well, now the dog is confused. Yep. She says, well, mommy doesn't love me anymore. Mm -hmm. Why don't you want me to do this anymore? If it was okay yesterday, it should be okay today and it should be okay tomorrow. But in the workplace, we always give people exceptions. I'm not saying be militaristically strict, but you have to be very clear. So here's where we saw this happen. Yes. Somebody showed up at a workplace mm -hmm. and they said, show up at 8.30 so that human resources can get you all checked in with your pay mm -hmm. and then come, come down to the office. So the person says, okay. They showed up at 8.25 early. They go to human resources. They get all checked in. They start working. So the next day, they show up for work at 8.30. The day after, 8.30. The day after that, 90 days go by, three months. And finally, the supervisor says, you know, it's just not working out. And the employee is so confused. They say, why? What's wrong? And the, the boss says, well, the other people on the team don't like you. <laughs> well, what do you mean they don't like me? They said, you know, what do you mean? I'm, I'm good at my job. I try to be a team player. What's the problem? And so finally, the manager says, you show up late every day. And the employee says, you told me to show up at 8.30. I've been showing up at 8.30. And they, you don't know if you're doing the right thing. You hope you are. And your manager, meanwhile, is thinking, um, they'll figure it out. Well, wait a minute. And often you need they communication. Don't. Yes. Is there a simple way to communicate? Because, you know, I know that for many managers or even business owners, right? I mean, Asia has a lot of business owners. Mm -hmm. The problem for them is time. Yes. Like if you talk to them, they understand that it's important to build people and they understand it's important to communicate. They just never have time for that. So I agree, but they don't how have to time. How do you go about it? They don't have time not to. Mm -hmm. So what good communication is most of all effective. It doesn't have to be long. It just has to be effective. So there are people in my life that we communicate in very short bursts of information. So when I land in a new city, I send a text to my family and it's six letters. That's it. It's a text. It's very fast. S-O-D. In the military, we fly, fly planes off carriers, you know. In the, yes. Okay. S-O-D stands for safe on deck. It means the, plan, the, the plane arrived on the deck of the aircraft carrier. So S-O-D for us means safe on deck. And then I put the airport code. And that way my family knows where I am in a quick text message. But I have other friends that... It must be fun to communicate text messages with your family members. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's very, but it's effective. And yes. now they don't worry. But I have some friends who need lots of words. So with you, I might be able to say, I'll be at the taping at 5 o'clock. Not a problem. Let me know if anything changes. Mary. With my family, I may be able to say, 5 o'clock. Okay. I don't need to say anything else. And some of my other friends, it might be something much longer. So you have to just be effective. Mm. And many managers lose effective, I call it effectiveness time, because people aren't sure but what to do. You, what you mean? You mean to be effective, but also to adapt communication style of the other person, right? Because yes. then you have to read what is the best for them. Like your family yes. members will get it. Yes. Then, then somebody else needs what you say more words. So it's very important to understand what effective and clear Yes. means for the other party. Yes, right? so we have to communicate based on how they learn. So how do we figure it out for those who don't know? We ask. <laughs> so I had a boss mm -hmm. who the first couple of days we were not communicating well. And so finally I walked in his office and I said, these are the magic words, boss. I, I'm getting crazy. Yes. I want to do a good job for you. Those are the magic words. I want to do a good job for you. I want to do a great job for you. So I need to know how you want me to best give you information. Do you want it first thing in the morning? Do you want it in writing? Do you want me to phone you? Do you want me to text you? Do you want an email with bullet points? Do you want an email with paragraphs? Would you like me to send in a carrier pigeon? Do you want post-its on your, on your desk? What do you need from me and how often do you need it for you to be comfortable with what I'm doing? And, and he had to think about it and he said, you know, what I really need is I need five minutes in the morning and five minutes at night so that I know exactly what's happening in the morning, you know what I'm worried about, and then at night I just need to know that it all happened. I said, 
Okay, now that's 10 minutes a day. And that sounds like a pain. It sounds like kind of a pain in the neck to do that. But, some people are. Right, but that way I wasn't guessing. I knew exactly what he wanted. First thing in the morning, I'd say, I got this. And he'd say, I have these five things. Well, then my focus shifted to his things, not mine. Yep. And then at the end of the day, I said, here we go. And we're finished. And he went, okay. So his relationship with me improved because his confidence built up. But I had, I had to force the communication so that I knew what he wanted. And then he also then felt comfortable. But I had to figure it. I had to ask him. And most people say, well, just give me whatever. No. Doesn't you tell me yeah. what you want. Yeah, you tell me what you want. Be very clear about and, it. And with some people, if you give them short words, I'm in Singapore, they think it's very rude. And, and then they, they are not happy, so you can't do that. But we have to communicate the way they best hear it. And that's the other big secret. Okay, so you know, in the, in the workplace, that's clear, mm -hmm. right? So for anybody, it doesn't matter what kind of job you do, whether you're employed, you're working for somebody, or you run your own business. I mean, mm -hmm. still the same style of communication. You could also talk to your clients, let's say, and ask them yes. the same questions. Yes. But let's say if you talk to somebody, maybe you don't know that well. Mm -hmm. And because you also mentioned, right, there has some people require different lengths of communication, different mm -hmm. number of words, mm -hmm. and different just the way how you, you even phrase sentences. Mm -hmm. Is there an intuitive way to learn it without actually asking them questions if maybe you don't have an opportunity to do this? Yes. Yes, what is that? We tend to communicate the way we like to be communicated to. So okay. if you see somebody's emails and they're very short, quick bursts of, of emails, that's how you can respond to them and that's how they will, they're good with that. But if you see somebody who's like, dear Yana, and then, and there's all these things, then that's kind of what they want back from you. I so we have, it. so you just have to take your, and you do it all the time as yep. an interviewer. Yep. You take your cue from how they best communicate. Yep. Mm -hmm. Basically, I mirror that. Mm -hmm. And you mirror and you, it's the same with text, emails, phone calls. I have some people, and I love it because they're very, and it's the same business, and they're very quick, short, to the point, hi, yes, no, boom, click. Yep. And then I've got somebody else where every time they call, I know it's going to be 45 minutes. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it means it's the best way for somebody who is wondering how to become a better communicator is first becoming a better listener and just be more aware of what's happening for other people. Yes. And, and literally mirror their style of communication. Yes. Oh, that's that's profound. But it's so simple. <laughs> yes, it, it is very simple. I, and, I love it. I and love we do it. it very naturally with babies. So if you see a baby, yeah. you're like, hello, little baby, hello. And our voice raises because that's where their tone is too. Yeah. And then they smile and gurgle at us. And then we do the same thing go, back. Ooh, do, do. <laughs> we do it with babies. Yes, we do It's that. very natural, but sometimes we just forget. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you do it with your puppy. Oh, with the puppy, yes, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, is there anything else uh, in the book? Um, because I have like all kind of other questions I want to ask. Yes. But I just don't want to miss out anything from this book. So is there any other message that maybe you would like to share with us? So there's a, there's a few that might be helpful yes. to your audience. Yes. So a few things are when you are trying to communicate with people, when you're trying to get more effectiveness or productivity mm -hmm. out of people, clarity is the top priority. How do you get clarity? Better communication. But you also have to set expectations and goals for other people, but also for yourself. I have a chapter on making sure that your goals are aligned with not just what you think and what you say, but what you do. Mm, it's like with children. Yes. They don't just listen to what you say. They become who you are. They be so. That's it. That's <laughs> it. And, and many people say, oh, my family comes first. And I go, okay, but you're working 29 days a month and you travel a lot and you've never seen your kids play ball. You don't help your kids with their homework. You haven't talked to your wife in days. You're, how do you say your family is the most yep. important? So part of that is making sure that as a leader, we know deep down inside what intrinsically motivates us and making sure that our goals are aligned with the goals of the organization and that our people's goals are worked into this equation. Because a great organization happens because of great talent mm -hmm. and great ideas, but also great internal resolutions. People will work crazy hours and do crazy things if they believe in the company and they believe in their leaders. And that's one of the other things, in the secrets in the book, is nobody quits a, a job. Nobody ever leaves a job. They quit their boss. 
you, they knew the job when they were hired. They mm -hmm. knew the, the compensation when they were hired. And when they go in and the boss makes them crazy, that's when they leave. Why do people leave? What makes people crazy about their bosses? And the big secret here is they don't feel appreciated. They don't feel as though they're listened to. They feel devalued. They feel as though they're not respected. They feel as though they're not appreciated for what they bring to the workplace. So how do we make them feel being appreciated? It's, that's a great question. And it's not what some people say that, oh, everybody gets a trophy. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay. Genuine appreciation is thank you so much for a specific action that you did when, and this is what it did for the organization, or this is what it did for me personally, or mm -hmm. whatever. People would rather have something personal and heartfelt mm -hmm. than the blanket or the, the sort of corporate, oh, thanks great everybody job. for a great job, <laughs> Every, delete, nobody cares. <laughs> or a microphone, thank you everyone for being here today, you're all doing a fan, nobody cares. Yeah, nobody cares. But if, one per, if, if you're walking down the hallway and somebody says, wow, thank you so much for that fabulous interview. Because of that interview that you did with Scott Friedman, it changed my life because I got involved with that organization and now that has become part of my passion. You changed my life. Now that means oh. something, <laughs> right? That means something. Even though you made it up, it still makes no. me feel better. But it, but it means something yeah, instead of just, there. thanks for your great stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Nobody cares about that. Yeah. So in order for appreciation to happen, it has to be specific for a specific action to a specific person and timely. You have to do it quickly afterwards, saying thank you five years later. Yeah, so you have to keep momentum, right? I mean, you have to use yes. it in the right moment. Although teachers, teachers love it when students 20 years later call them up and say, by the way, you changed my life. Oh, aren't we all do this from time to time? And we, ca and we kind of, and everybody's thinking, who are my teachers? And I should call them up and thank them. Like, <laughs> this is what I, we always love to hear. Because, the mistakes. You know, yes, people, the mistakes. People, people love the mistakes. You know, people, it, it's like we were discussing with Scott earlier, you know, it's all fantastic when we talk about success mm -hmm. and people go, yeah, that's great. But when you talk about mistakes, people go, yeah, I can relate to that. Mm -hmm. So if you could share with us maybe one mistake oh. that you did and how you learned from that. Oh, there's so many to <laughs> choose from. Um, there was a time when I was a military chief of police. Mm -hmm. So I had about 300 cops working for me. And you know when you drive down the streets in Singapore or wherever, it doesn't matter, and the flashing lights come on behind you? Yeah. The first, you know you're in trouble. Right. <laughs> That's the first thought that comes. Right. You're like, oh, no. <laughs> and the first thought is, what did I do wrong? Wrong, yeah. And then you think, and then your second thought is, and what did they see me do wrong? You know, what, I mean, how much trouble <laughs> How am much I can I negotiate when right. they stop me? <laughs> That's it. That's it. And... And the problem there is you don't, as I say, you don't get that feeling in your stomach for, I mean, we've all done something naughty at some point in our lives, but you don't say, oh gosh, that's just the, the police saying, you know, welcome to Singapore, or thank you for coming to Russia, or, you know, you're, you're pretty sure you're, you're in trouble. And so I was in the job for about 90 days, and I had a list, and it was a good practice that I was doing back then, and I had a list of characteristics. And I went into my boss and I said, you know, boss, I want to do a great job for you. And these are the, the magic words. The magic words. These are the characteristics that I think I bring to this job. And I gave him three characteristics. I said, I think I'm, I'm mission oriented. I think I'm meticulous. I think I'm fair, whatever. I, and I said, but I want to make sure that those are the characteristics that you want me to bring to this job. Mm -hmm. And he looked at the list and he said, yeah, no. I'm, <laughs> what? So it was, it was a <laughs> Scooby-Doo moment. I'm like, ruh, ruh, ruh. <laughs> What? And, and I thought these were good characteristics. And he said, no. He said, I want, I want you to be friendly. I want you to be obliging when people have a problem. And I want you to be cheerful. OK, well, I can be all those things. I'm naturally those way. But I said, but you know I'm your head of security here. And he said, yes. And he said, when you show up and your people show up, I want people to say, the good guys are here. They're here to help me. Oh. I want that perception shifted. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, I can absolutely do that. But it shifted my focus, how I approached the job, and then how I trained my people. Mm -hmm. But I would never have known if I hadn't asked the question and he hadn't been honest enough to answer. So sometimes people are out there doing things that they think is what you mm -hmm. want as the boss. 
and that's not what you as the boss want. And, and that was a mistake. That I, did, I should have done it on the third day, and I didn't. You know, there's mistakes that I've made like that where I, I thought I was doing the right thing, and I wasn't. And you know, I think it's just so relevant because it, it's actually to everything, to business, to relationship, to everything. Mm -hmm. Because very often we get trapped in our own thought process, yes. and we all also perceive situation and ourselves very different. Yes. So when we might be, we might think that we are doing all the right things, and we are actually coming across being, uh, let's say, appreciative enough, and we mm -hmm. communicate clear. But for the other party, it might be not at all the truth. So That's it is it. so important to talk about it and actually ask people for at least their feedback, right? Whether it is mm -hmm. the boss or your colleague at work, or even if it's husband or wife or your kids, you know, it's like yes. the all areas of our life, just to be very clear that you give them what they want in the form they understand. And, and so yesterday, right? yesterday I was able to talk at the, at the HR summit. Yep. And I had 500 people in the audience, and I asked the question, I said, how many of you people here today feel as though at work you are overappreciated? Not one person. How many of you feel as though you're appreciated enough? Not one person. And, and, and partly it's because our bosses think that they're letting us know that we're appreciated, mm -hmm. but a lot of times that's not really getting internally to us. And then I say, for a fun game, try this at home. How many of you people feel over-appreciated at home? And that's part of the issue. So, so I said, you know, if you're that person who appreciates people genuinely, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not saying you should give prizes for nothing, mm -hmm. but if you're that person who genuinely appreciates people and you let them know, you're going to stand out. And your clients know, I mean, when you really appreciate your clients or you really appreciate your customers or you really appreciate the people who get to work with you, it stands out. Mm -hmm. That's always been part of the military background, mm -hmm. and we were raised, of course, to that. It, we were kind of raised with the idea that it doesn't matter where you are, even if you're you feel like you're at the bottom, there's somebody who's two steps behind mm -hmm. you. And your job, if you're if you're wherever you are in your life, is to grab somebody who's two steps behind you and pull them up, and and that you're just expected to do that. And so, when I was in the military and I would do these talks they would sometimes have an honorarium. Well, in uniform, you, of course, do not accept that. That's not how this works. And they said, but we have to give the honorarium to somebody. And I said, well, I said, if I gave you a few charities, would you think about donating to those charities? And so that's where that started. And even now, with my book sales, my mm -hmm. CDs, my DVDs, work books, everything, when I get sales after events, mm -hmm. none of, I don't take any of that money. So if you write a check, if you want a book, mm -hmm. you write the check to a charity. Mm -hmm. You never give it to me. Mm -hmm. And that's my business model for my business, is I don't take any of the revenues from any of my products. And not everybody can, can do yeah. that, but... But it's a great way to give back. It's a great way. those who can. Absolutely. So let's say I'm in Singapore, and, uh, and the meeting planner says, here's, you know, we want to sell books, and mm -hmm. I say, great, you have an ASPCA here, you have a Humane Society, you have an animal, whatever, or there's another good cause. Or the meeting planner says, yes, my, my child's been diagnosed with leukemia, and there's a Singapore Leukemia Society or whatever. I say, great, let's pick three charities, and when people come to buy the CD or the DVD or the book, then they write the check to the charity. So as, a, as an audience person, you're sitting there thinking, well, I, should I buy the book? And mm -hmm. then you say, wait a second, but I get a tax deduction, I get tax credit for buying the book and as I a get charity, the book. and I get the book. This is fantastic. So it's win-win for everybody. Yeah. And for me personally, then I don't have to do taxes. <laughs> I don't have to pay taxes and on that because I just give it And it satisfies one of the basic human needs to be actually to contribute. Yes. Because we all want to feel good about that. Yes. Yes. So I started with Together We Can Change the World when I was at a, a dinner party at Scott's house. Mm -hmm. And he told me about these efforts that fund 13 orphanages in Southeast Asia. And when I had been living out here before in the Philippines and in Vietnam, I had been to some of the refugee camps. And people don't realize how hard it is to be a refugee and how hard it is to be displaced mm -hmm. from your home. And we're certainly seeing that in a variety of places around the world. And I think that, again, wherever you are, you're responsible for other people. And it doesn't matter if they're in your country or outside your country, you're responsible for other people. And we all need to do something. Business is going to save the world. Tell me more about that. Business, 
when you're doing business with someone, you have a relationship. Mm -hmm. And that means you may not be friends, but you're also not going to hurt each other. And, and people, people kind of don't understand this necessarily, that business facilitates relationships where state departments fail, mm -hmm. where, where other people, you know, you look at other people and you see it on the news and maybe there's, you know, one country's angry at another country. It's usually not the people. It's usually just the leaders or there's an issue and they're just not getting along as well as they might. And the place where people get brought together is business. And if you have a business, and this is what I might encourage people, if you have an idea for a business or you've got some kind of need in the marketplace that you can identify, and if you can focus on business and facilitate business, this is going to save the world because people building businesses lifts people out of poverty. It gives people opportunities they wouldn't have, even if they don't have the education, that if you've got vibrant businesses that are hiring people, then other people get lifted out of poverty. And, and poor people need capitalism more than wealthy people. Poor people need the opportunity. By poor, I mean you know, people who are in that bottom 40% yep. of income earners yep. who, need, who need the opportunity that business provides. And I'm passionate about helping people with business because I have seen what businesses can do when the market forces them to work together. And, and I say force, but, but no, when you go to the store and you buy you buy um, a loaf of bread mm -hmm. in the store. You give them money and they say thank you. And you mm -hmm. take the bread mm -hmm. and, and thank you. And everybody's happy. And so markets work. Markets, markets just make people work together in ways that, that you can't force other people to work together in a way that nothing else can. Well, and I guess it also brings to the point when business owners don't have to feel guilty. They're not necessarily running a nonprofit, right? Because oh, there's the whole no. the social perception that if you run a nonprofit or if, or if you do... Uh, a social enterprise, then you're doing a good stuff. But if you're running business for business, you look a bad person, right? So yes. it doesn't have to be that perception, even if you're focusing on doing business for business by providing jobs for people to feed their families. That's yes. good enough. That's good. The market, the market identifies efficiencies. And if you're a business and you're doing well, then you're doing something right. And when you are doing well in your business, now you're hiring people. Now they have jobs. Jobs give people dignity and respect. And now they can fund their family. And now they can be part of the community. And when you're making profit in your business, now you can do things in the community. When you look around and there's a need in the community that's not being filled, we go to businesses who live in that community and we say, can you help? Well, if your business is doing well, then the answer is yes, I can help. If your business is failing, then the answer is no. So there's some great nonprofits out there. Out there but nonprofit doesn't necessarily mean that that you're doing things as purely as you could there's just a scandal mm -hmm. with a lot of our charities mm -hmm. um, where people were collecting money and they were keeping it oh that happens from time to time everywhere and in business it if you're if you're not running a good business you're gonna go out of business yeah. so there's there's a little bit more efficiency the marketplace will figure it out faster than just about anything else but being a good business person means now you're a good person in society. And people should not be ashamed of doing well in business. Doing well in business means you're doing a lot of things right. Well, that sounds great. <laughs> and on my website for your business yep. people, there are, I have some templates uh -huh. that I use for my business people. There's a, a business plan, a five minute business plan, a big long business plan. There's, and the website is? It's productiveleaders.com. Productive productiveleaders. We will make sure we include that, productiveleaders.com. There's just a ton of free stuff for, mm -hmm. for business people, for leaders, looking for resources, things like that. And, and it's all free. And people say, well, why do you give this away? Well, for a couple reasons. First, yes. if I can help other businesses and other leaders get better, then you know, a rising tide does lift all boats. Mm -hmm. But the other part is that when people start using things over and over and they get better, now that part of the economy improves. Now there's, there's people out there who are going to get jobs. There's people out there who are going to create jobs. There's going to be trade. All these things are going to happen, and it's all good. And we're, we all have to work together. And sometimes we don't always realize how we're all working together, but by sharing information, and that's what you do. Of course, we bring people to people. We bring basically. people to people. We just make information very accessible. Yes. Across cultures. Yes.
So this is actually the fourth product we launched. Mm -hmm. So we knew the third products. I, I wouldn't say, I, I don't want to call it flop because maybe my colleagues will be listening, but, but the first three products didn't work quite as well. <laughs> <laughs> quite as well as uh, the, the, the PTEX product. So we knew when we launched PTEX, it's a completely different level of engagement that we were able to capture from uh, customer, potential customers. Mm -hmm. So that's how we knew, okay, this is a product we need to invest in, not the other three so much.